This almost recognisable landscape depicts Australia around a million years ago. It is an illustration by Peter Scouten, the paleo artist behind CSIRO Publishing's new book, Prehistoric Australasia. The new title is a follow-up to a book that Scouten worked on decades ago. What is the process for an illustrator who specialises in paleontological drawings? Do they have to be experts in prehistory themselves, or do they consult with paleontology researchers? In the process of producing that, that very first book, I should say it wasn't even a book at that stage. I, I just came, brought together a collection of uh, drawings that I did off my own bat of um, Australian megafauna. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took them into Mike Archer at uh, New South Uni uh, for appraisal. And he, he, he loved them so much, he thought, well, let's, let's do a book. Uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> straight, virtually straight out of school and straight into um, producing a book. Followed that by actually being employed in Mike's department as a fossil preparator. And that just opened up all sorts of avenues for me. It gave me an insight into not only the preparation of fossils, but um, I had access not only to the bones, but I also had access to uh, modern animals. So I was able to do dissections, to look at musculature. I had uh, the best library libraries on tap. I had the best knowledge on tap because um, even at that time, Tim Flannery, was, Tim Flannery was doing his uh, PhD while I was there, working on fossil kangaroos. Oh. Yes, I, uh, I, I, I drew up a strong collaboration with these guys while I was there. But um, over the subsequent years, I've pretty much gone out on my own and mm -hmm. uh, taught myself uh, paleontology and um, paleo reconstruction. When it comes to a project like the current one, I pretty much come up with the image mm -hmm. and send those off, off to whoever's um, the expert in that field. And I then get their appraisal and I'll make adjustments where necessary. But I don't necessarily approach them from the very start. Mm -hmm. uh, all that information is gathered by looking through the scientific papers that, that they themselves had published. And I try to um, see what needs to be incorporated. If, for instance, a, you know, a fossil has a... Um, particularly a unique set of teeth or something, I'll show, try and show the animal with its mouth open and depict those teeth. Same with the, you know, the habitat of the, the animal. I, I try to um, surmise that from the scientific papers. If, if there's no information about that there, I'll look elsewhere for that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it is, it is a collaboration, but a long distance one. There are some surprises in the book. Even those who have lived their whole lives in Australia might open up to a given page and say, wow, this existed here. The one that really, that I get most questioned about, the two of them actually, flamingos mm -hmm. yep. and um, freshwater dolphins. Right. Um, the urinodelphids that used to be found in the middle, middle of Australia. And also the, you know, huge flocks of flamingos that we had here. Most of the people that I, uh, I've shown the book to have questioned that. They think, oh, what, there were flamingos here? Why aren't they here now? <laughs> well, yeah. because all those lakes are dried up. What was the most scientifically challenging pieces to create what what was the one that required the most thought or you know the most redrafts or whatever it was i think the one that i probably spent the most time on is my actual my actual namesake so uh, wackaleo scout and i yep. <laughs> that was my completed painting uh, i sent it through to mark arch and he said oh i don't like the tail i don't think they would have had fairy tails mm -hmm. and uh, i i I didn't question him, but I, I, at the time, I thought, well, this thing wasn't as big as um, Thylaca Leo. It mm -hmm. would have probably spent quite a bit of time in, in trees. Mm -hmm. um, a long furry tail acts as a good um, counterbalance uh, when you're clambering around um, trees, much as you get with um, snow leopards, for instance, or uh, even the modern leopard that's got a bushier tail than a, than a lion does. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's that. As I said earlier, things that re require me to show the dentition. Thylacoleonids are another a, a classic case in point there where you need to show the, the dagger-like um, uh, in lower incisors and the bolt cutter um, carnassials. Yeah. And so, you know, in those cases, the animals invariably have to be shown with a mouth open. And yeah. The other, other one that I always have trouble with is when 
it's a really important fossil. Mm. You know, it might be an entirely new order of mammal, but it's only known by, you know, a scrap of a jawbone with a couple of teeth. Mm. I mean, that's just not enough to go by. Yeah. In the St. Bathans um, reconstructions in New Zealand, if you look closer, you'll find a, a, a face of a small mammal peering from <laughs> deep in the shadows of a log. Yeah. And that was a case in point. That's mm. a, a definitely a placental mammal. Yeah, terrestrial placental mammal that was found in New Zealand uh, during the Miocene, and uh, but there's nothing known about it except for a scrap of a jawbone and some teeth. Uh, yeah. But it, it had to go in because it's a really important case. So sometimes paleo artists can get away with showing only portions of animals by immersing them in their environment. This helps get around the fact that we don't yet know enough about some of these creatures from current research. Another really classic one in that case is uh, Palocestes, mm -hmm. which is the large sort of sloth-like marsupial. It was originally known from a, a quite a poorly preserved skull. It was badly shattered and built back together again. And the, the four limbs were, were quite well known as well. So it was assumed to be somewhere between a you know, a giant ground sloth and a, and a tapir in appearance. And I had always reconstructed it in that way before, yeah. you know, reaching up for branches or tearing off bark to, to eat. But in light of a new specimen, uh, a sub-adult that was found in Victoria, which is a beautifully preserved skull, I had to completely redo it. Yeah. And, um, and the moment I looked at that skull, I thought, this thing's aquatic. <laughs> this thing's amphibious. Yeah. It has to be. I mean, it's... Its eyes are right on the very, very top of its head. So are the ears. And mm. uh, whether it um, kept a tapir-like snout, I don't mm. know. But there was definitely something massive happening on the front of its face. And I thought, well, it's got to go in the water. The, the question arises from that. What does a marsupial do with its pouch young when it's in the water? Some questions can't easily be answered when reconstructing animals that lived tens of thousands or millions of years ago. This is because the fossil record is pretty sparse, but showcasing prehistory is vital for understanding the world today. The thing that I, I most, uh, that I insist on with pretty much all the books that I do is that it's got to be accessible to everybody, mm. whether an 80 year old or an 80 year old, yeah. they've got to be able to read it and they've got to be able to understand it. And so my role is to take those dry scientific papers and in interpret them through illustration in a way that they can un immediately understand. The great thing about having these wonderful authors, Mike and Sue and uh, Trevor and John, is that they're fantastic at um, writing for the public, writing in a discursive way and, and being able to make, make sense for the ordinary Joe Blow on the street. Um, fairly, fairly dry science. <laughs>